Uh, hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and we're ready to proceed with our course in T.S. Eliot. In this file, I want to say something about T.S. Eliot's biography. I think it's um, necessary to understand any artist that we know something about his life uh, and the formative influences on his work. Uh, T.S. Eliot was born in 1888 in St. Louis, Missouri. The reason he was born there is that his grandfather, William Greenleaf Eliot, emigrated from Boston, where the Eliots had been living since the 17th century, uh, and where they had become, you might say, upper class society in the Boston area with uh, one Eliot having become president of Harvard and with other Eliots uh, in similar positions of distinction, including a line of clergymen in the Unitarian Church. William Greenleaf Eliot, the poet's grandfather, went to Missouri to bring the light of his Unitarian faith into the darkness of that Roman Catholic city of St. Louis. Uh, one of the ventures that he undertook to facilitate that project was to help found one of our great universities, Washington University in St. Louis. Eliot's father, Henry Ware Eliot, uh, was a prosperous owner of a brick family. His mother, Charlotte Stearns Eliot, gave birth to the poet when she was 45 years old. He was the youngest of seven children. And um, I think because his parents were almost at the age of grandparents, uh, there was a gap, a serious time gap between parent and child. And I think this exacerbated the feeling of loneliness that shows up so importantly in Eliot's poetry. In effect, Eliot reversed his ancestors' migration. That is to say, he got out of St. Louis as soon as he could. When he was a teenager, he went to Milton Academy in Massachusetts. And after that, he went to Harvard to get his bachelor's degree. At Harvard at that time, uh, around the years 1906 to 1910, uh, there was a galaxy of eminent professors. George Lyman Kittredge, the great Chaucer and Shakespeare scholar. Um, George Santayana, the philosopher, was teaching there. William James was there, though he didn't teach classes. Nonetheless, uh, perhaps our greatest genius uh, in America for psychology, um, religious thinking, and philosophy. Uh, Bertrand Russell was there the man who won the Nobel Prize in 1950 and who became an important influence on T.S. Eliot in several ways, including in his personal life. Other professors, including Irvin Babbitt and Josiah Royce. At Harvard, his most important discovery uh, by happenstance was a book he came across under a staircase among a stack standing there outside the editor's office of the undergraduate literary magazine. This book was by Arthur Simons, S-Y-M-O-N-S, -S, The Symbolist Movement in Literature, dated 1899. Uh, in particular, the French symbolist poets exerted a very large influence on T.S. Eliot's early years on his formation as a poet. And he singled out one of these French symbolist poets in a comment later in his life, in fact, when he was an old man, really. He said that he owed more to any than to any other writer, living or dead. He owed more to Jules Laforgue, L-A-F-O-R-G-U-E. He owed more to that man than to any other poet, including Dante and Shakespeare, uh, whom he praised lavishly. 
Uh, and if you look at the poetry of Jules Lefort, look it up on the internet, perhaps uh, if you can get a translation, and you'll see that it resembles very substantially Eliot's early poems, such as the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, or Rhapsody on a Windy Night. The same style, the same tone, the same sort of imagery. Uh, and uh, so we can see why Eliot made that comment. He also studied the Elizabethan dramatists at Harvard, and later he taught some of them when he briefly uh, served as a teacher in England. Uh, writers like John Webster, Christopher Marlowe, Beaumont and Fletcher, and uh, similar figures. In 1910, after he graduated from Harvard, he obtained um, a, an appointment as a student at the University of the Sorbonne in Paris. He was fluent enough, fluent enough in French so that he went there for a year. He uh, went to lectures, he could understand them perfectly, delivered in French by the likes of Henri Bergson, the very eminent French philosopher. And of course, he could study even more deeply the French symbolist poets while he was living in Paris. The most important thing that happened in Paris was his encounter with another young man in the boarding house where they both lived in Paris. That man's name was Jean Verdenau. And they were, you might say, soulmates literary soulmate, certainly, cultural soulmate, you could say. Vernonau was a medical student, but he loved literature. And I think for the first time in his life, T.S. Eliot met somebody who really understood Eliot and what he was attempting to do, wanted to do as a writer and thinker. Uh, someone who would, of course, in that fashion, usher in the modern period in English poetry as time went on. He and um, Eliot and uh, his friend Jean Verdinal went to opera together. They uh, traveled about parts of Europe together and were indeed very close friends. Predictably, some scholars would declare that there was a homosexual relationship between them. Although that might be possible, I don't think it's necessary to uh, attribute uh, that sort of connection to these two men. I think what Eliot found was something he had never experienced in America or among his other contacts in Europe. Someone who would understand and sympathize and facilitate Eliot's, um, Eliot's efforts as an artist. In uh, 1911, he ended his year at the Sorbonne, went back to Harvard to study for a PhD in philosophy. Uh, and indeed, Harvard thought so well of him that there was an understanding that after he obtained his PhD in philosophy, he would become a faculty member teaching philosophy at Harvard. He studied uh, not only philosophy, but religion assiduously. He even learned some Sanskrit so that he could study the Hindu religion in the original language. And there are some scraps of Sanskrit that appear in the wasteland. In July 1914, Eliot won a scholarship to study in that great Mecca for philosophers, Germany. And uh, he went to Marburg, a city where he hoped to take up his studies in the summer of 1914. In August of that year, World War I broke out, so Eliot could not complete his studies in Germany. Instead, he went to London. And in September 1914, a classmate, Harvard classmate of his, introduced him to Ezra Pound, then living in London. Ezra Pound was perhaps the most influential man of his time in English and American literature. He guided and mentored a number of artists, 
uh, ushering them into the modern period, which he uh, propagated, I think, more avidly than anyone else. And it, it, we can say that he and T.S. Eliot together brought about a revolution in poetry that uh, we now dub the modern period in poetry. Among the people that T.S. Eliot mentored, very importantly, were William Butler Yeats, a considerably older man, but one that T.S. Eliot, excuse me, that Ezra Pound uh, drew into modern poetry through his ministrations. He also was a very important help to Robert Frost, who came to England for a couple of years, and Ezra Pound helped him become successful and famous as a published poet in England, after which Frost went back to America as a famous poet. Uh, also, to, uh, Ernest Hemingway was a, um, an acolyte of Ezra Pound, and uh, Hemingway gave Pound a lot of credit for helping him uh, come into his own as a young artist. It was Ezra Pound who helped Eliot publish his first um, published poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, five years after it was written in 1915. The poem came out in an, uh, a little magazine called Poetry Magazine. Uh, two years later, T.S. Eliot published a collection, Prufrock and Other Observations, dedicated to that same soulmate of his back in Paris, to Jean Verdinau. Now at this time in 1917, Jean Verdinau had been dead for two years. He had been sucked up into World War I as a soldier. He had been sent to the Dardanelles campaign, uh, and that was a misconceived idea sometimes attributed to Winston Churchill, that uh, the Allies should attack the soft underbelly of Europe, namely Turkey, not a, not a very soft underbelly. And when the Allied soldiers stormed the beaches of Turkey, they were slaughtered by the thousands, a uh, catastrophic failure of a campaign. It was thought that John Verdinal drowned uh, in that effort to storm the beaches. And I think that idea shows up in Eliot in a number of occasions in the motif of death by water, one of the sections of the wasteland. In any case, the death of his soulmate in April 1915 might have influenced the opening line of the wasteland, April is the cruelest month. Uh, in any case, it affected Eliot in that the great vacancy in his life left by his deceased friend was filled, he thought, by Eliot getting married. He married a young woman he had on, only known for two or three months, uh, a young woman named Vivian Haig Wood. And uh, in June, they got married after having met perhaps in April or a little earlier. Uh, he married her without even introducing her to his family, which led to a very unhappy situation back in America. Uh, and at, after that, uh, he really was tied down in England. Uh, he, I think, enjoyed England immensely, uh, felt that it had a superior culture to what he had experienced in America. And in particular, uh, through Ezra Pound, in London, he would have a network of other artists that he could hobnob with uh, a community such as he had never previously experienced. The sort of community, I think, that Jean Verdinal had supplied uh, while he was still alive. So he stayed in England through most of World War I. There was a fear of submarine warfare, which kept, uh, certainly kept his wife there in England, and I think kept T.S. Eliot from voyaging back home for several years. In um, 1916, um, he um, settled into an apartment 
with um, his wife that was furnished by his old professor Bertrand Russell. Uh, they had met each other on the street in London and Russell asked how his former student was doing and Eliot said that he was somewhat hard up for money because of this unhappy relationship with his family back home, part of the reason. So Bertrand Russell offered them the use of his flat and one of the outcomes of that arrangement was that the three of them lived together uh, for a while and Bertrand Russell, uh, a ladies man at the time, uh, seduced Eliot's bride. They went off for a week or so uh, at the beach, at Margate Beach, a term that shows up in the wasteland also. Uh, and it turned out indeed that this was a very bad marriage for both parties. Both T.S. Eliot and his wife had nervous breakdowns. His wife became, in the end, a permanent situation. She had to be confined to an institution. And Eliot himself um, under, underwent his breakdown at the time he was writing The Wasteland uh, in the early 1920s. Ironically, Eliot's breakdown enriched his poem, The Wasteland. In effect, the whole culture in the Western world, as he saw it, was undergoing a breakdown because of the cultural collapse that uh, pertained following and indeed during World War I. The old certitudes, uh, the old social hierarchy had been broken to pieces by the war and the beliefs that people lived by were no longer tenable in a number of areas, socially, politically, religiously. And in that sense, that breakdown certainly affected Eliot a great deal, along with the problems in his marriage and with his health. Uh, at the time, he was writing his great poem. In 1919, he published a little book of essays, The Sacred Wood, and this book, together with some later essays, and his editorship of a magazine for 20 years, The Criterion, all enabled him to influence the entire cultural uh, understanding of his reading audience. Because he was so famous as a poet, he had a large reading audience. The most important part of that audience would be other artists. And through writing these essays, in very large measure, he was able to propagate the revolution in poetry that he and Ezra Pound were bringing off in the years after World War I. A new kind of poetry, uh, whose precepts we'll get to in the next file. Meanwhile, we need to uh, proceed with T.S. Eliot's biography. Uh, he published The Wasteland late in the year 1922, uh, initially without the notes at the end of the wasteland. Then he brought out the poem as a sort of a pamphlet standing on its own, to which he added the notes. There have been arguments about the notes to the wasteland, whether they should be there or not. Uh, in my opinion, they add a very valuable coda to the poem, not only for helping us understand the wasteland, which they do, but as a sort of opening of a door of the artist's workshop. This is the stuff out of which I made the poem. Uh, have a look at uh, an honest, open look at what goes on in the artist's workbench. In 1925, he followed up the wasteland with the hollow men. Uh, it was said in Time Magazine's obituary of T.S. Eliot in 1965 that he gave us the cathartic utterances of the age. Uh, and among those cathartic utterances, we'd have to include several of these titles. The Wasteland, The Hollow Men. Now, these would be metaphors uh, by which the age could understand itself uh, in this time of a breakdown of culture, of beliefs to live by. And that concept of metaphor, I think, is very important in modern literature at large. 
uh, way back in Aristotle's Poetics, chapter 22, Aristotle declared that the greatest thing by far for a poet is to be a master of metaphor. It is a certain sign of genius. It is something that cannot be learned from others. He also added that uh, the interpretation of metaphor on the part of the reader is one of the surest signs of intelligence. So Eliot did strike off the master metaphors of his age in lines like the wasteland, the hollow man, and we're going, of course, to get more specific as we get into the poems, striking off new metaphors by which people could attain a better understanding of the life they are living. In 1927, he made an astounding announcement for many of his audience, namely that he had become a royalist in politics, as conservative as you can be, a classicist in literature. Uh, everyone thought he was a revolutionary in literature, but no, I am a classicist. I revere tradition. And most surprisingly, I have become an Anglo-Catholic in religion, that is to say, a Christian. At that time also, when he entered the Church of England, he took a vow of celibacy, which he would maintain, we believe, through the rest of his marriage uh, until his wife died in 1947 uh, in an institution. He published another major poem, Ash Wednesday, reflecting this experience of conversion to the Christian faith. And then in the 1930s, he began what would become his final and some think his greatest work, Four Quartets, begun in the 1930s and completed in 1943. In uh, 1947, as I mentioned, his wife died. In 1948, at the age of 60, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. In uh, January 1957, to everyone's surprise, he got married. His second wife was a young woman who had obtained a job at T.S. Eliot's publishing house, Faber and Faber, where Eliot was a part owner. And she managed to wangle her way across the office to become T.S. Eliot's personal secretary. And it seems that they hit it off so well that at one point T.S. Eliot gave her as her boss a stack of papers and asked her to look through them while he stood by. And on one of the pages, uh, Eliot had written, will you marry me? She obliged and they were married in January 1957. It uh, was a very happy marriage, unlike the first marriage. Unfortunately, T.S. Eliot's health was going bad, and uh, he gradually deteriorated in his health until he died in January 1965. Uh, that will conclude a thumbnail sketch of his biography. I recommend several books of biography. Uh, Lyndall Gordon's two-volume biography is excellent. Peter Aykroyd's one-volume biography also is very fine. And I recommend also a book by a woman named Carol Seymour Jones. The title is Painted Shadow, A Life of Vivian Elliot. It is a marvelous book. I re recommend it very highly for the biography of T.S. Eliot, an account and an account of this supremely important thing in his life, his marriage to his first wife. We'll end the biography there and proceed uh, with another uh, file uh, shortly.